Amen. Well, have a seat. It's good to see you all tonight. I'm amazed that this many people came out on the week of Easter. I'm proud of you. Um, if you haven't been with us on Wednesday nights, we are in the middle of a series called Need to Know. And each Wednesday, we are just going through different aspects of, of our faith and Christianity, looking at what the Bible says about them so that we can kind of have a well-rounded understanding. Now, a part of my intention in doing this is that after it's all over, uh, I want to have these studies available to people so that at any you know, place along the way, if somebody comes to the Lord or they're new to church, that they can begin to, to listen to these studies and we'll eventually put together a study guide that includes all of the uh, handouts that we give out for these. And so, um, so you're kind of here seeing it in person and it's something that I want to, to end up making available to people so that they can always get a good summary of what do we believe? What, what does Christianity teach? So on Sundays, we're always teaching from a text of scripture, but on Wednesday nights during this series, we want to get a big picture of the different things that the Bible says. So our topic for tonight is the church. The word church in Greek is ekklesia, and it's the word kaleo, or to be called, and ek, which means out of. So the description of the church that at least comes etymologically from the term itself is that people who are a part of the church are those who are called out. Called out to what? Well, called to be special. Feeling that there's a special um, call that God puts on our lives that then allows us to function in a way that's different than every other institution, every other organism, every other way of doing life. The church is the place where we aren't supposed to be like everything else. We are to be unique and we all together as parts of God's church understand that we have been called out, called to be different. That means the church shouldn't totally resemble any other organization. It shouldn't look like a business. It shouldn't look like a social club. It shouldn't look like a you know, charitable organization. The church is to be in individual and unique to what God has called people to in the church. Now, the, the word church is used in two senses. Sometimes we talk about the church as people will say the universal church. That is, talking about the church as being comprised of every follower of Jesus, every Christian, everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ is in fact a part of the church universal or what they used to call the Catholic church until that meant the Roman, the church that centered on Rome. The word Catholic just means universal. So there are places in scripture um, I mentioned in Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus, this is the first mention of the church in this respect, in this regard in the New Testament. And, you know, Jesus was saying, hey, who do people say that I am? And they were tossing out these theories. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. And then we see, as he said, my father who is in heaven did. In verse 18, he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Peter isn't the rock. It's, I believe it's the confession of who Jesus is. Hey, you said this. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. My father did. That you understand I am the Messiah, the son of the living God. And your name is, is Peter. And upon this rock, it's a play on words, a small rock and a large cliff. 
um, two different Greek words for, for rock. But he says, this is what I'm going to build my church on. It's built on the foundation, not of Peter. That certainly, you know, after this happened, Peter denied even knowing Jesus. And there's nothing, you know, in the, from the beginning of the church to ever suggest that somehow Peter is the one that the church is built on. The church is built on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So belief in Jesus is what makes you a part of the church. And you have this guarantee that's amazing, that the church will always last, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That doesn't mean that the gates of hell won't prevail against our church. But it's talking about the church as a whole. For, for 2,000 years, there has been the church of Jesus Christ. There have been people who followed Jesus, who acknowledged who he was, who put their trust and their faith in him. There were periods of time when there weren't a lot of people. There are periods of time when the churches got pretty messed up. And even today, there are an awful lot of churches that it's hard to say that they even believe in Jesus anymore, and yet they call themselves churches. But the universal church is the congregation of everyone who has put their trust in Jesus Christ. So sometimes the word church is used in that respect. There are other places like where Paul talked about, I persecuted the church. So when he says the church singular, he is generally talking about the church universal because he went and persecuted many individual churches, but he, but he persecuted the church as a whole, the body of Christ. However, church is also used about a local assembly, a local church. And really when you look in the New Testament, it, the word church is used a whole lot more for individual churches than it is for the church of Jesus Christ. Um, there are people who want to put down the idea that there are a lot of churches, and yet in the first century, even with really a small number of, of converts compared to the size of, of the world and, and compared to the population of the Roman Empire and even the population of Jerusalem, there were quite a few churches. But throughout, throughout the New Testament, we see throughout Acts and all the epistles, there are specific letters to the church that's at Galatia or the church that's in Antioch or even in, in Revelations chapter 2 and 3 when Jesus addresses the church, he doesn't address the church, he addresses the churches, seven specific churches that existed in those days. And so 35 times in the New Testament, church is used in a plural way, the churches. Not to mention uh, many, many times when a specific church is used as well. So it's important for us to recognize that it's okay to say, this is our church. This is Calvary Chapel Pacific Hills, the church that's here on Moulton. And it's okay that there's another church right across the parking lot from us. It's okay that there are other churches all over the place. Sometimes people feel like, oh no, it should just be one church. Not so much. It's okay that there are a lot of different churches. There were right from the beginning, and, and yet at the same time, we are all one. When it comes to the church universal, the people who have put their faith in Jesus, there are a lot of different people who do church different ways who are certainly all a part of the church as a whole. This week I went to a a pastor's prayer thing for Easter. And they had a lot of different types of churches there, different pastors from different denominations and cultural backgrounds and things like that. And it was, it was really a blessing that everyone was there because of Jesus, because our faith is in Jesus. And I saw, and at the same time, it was kind of a, a struggle in some ways because it's kind of awkward hearing people who, say things differently than we do or who pray some things that we're like, eh, I don't know about that. But at the same time, as, as we work on being one, 
it was, it was good for me to listen to all of that and just go, I am so thankful that we are one church. At the same time, I'm thankful that we have multiple churches. Because some of those churches I really wouldn't want to go to. I just wouldn't feel comfortable there. But I'm glad they're there. So in a sense, one church, you know, the one that will, that will last forever, the, the one that the gates of hell won't prevail against, and then there are individual churches where we try to do the best that we can to reflect what it is that God has called us to be. Now, I have here some metaphors for the church, and it's important to notice these because each metaphor for the church isn't the church, but it shows us certain characteristics of the church and is kind of helpful. The church is called the bride of Christ uh, over in Ephesians chapter 5. And if, you, if you're so inclined, you can turn over there. I'll turn to some of these scriptures. Some of them I won't for the sake of time. But in Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so he shows here that, you know, and then husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So making it, you know, clear that, in one metaphoric sense, actually marriage is something that's designed to imitate the relationship that Christ has with the church that God wants to have with us. But as a result, the church is called the, bri- is called the bride of Christ. Um, and that's one, you know, and you can see in this passage there are certain ramifications of that. And all the way, you know, all the way down through the rest of that chapter, you know, he says, it's a mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church when he's talking about marriage. Um, the church is also called a building. And in some respects, uh, the building seems to be seen as a temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, a passage that um, many of you are familiar with, beginning with verse um, Nine, he says, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given as a master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, your work will become clear in the day. Um, And he goes on and talks more about, and down in verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So again, yeah, it's kind of like a marriage, but it's also kind of like a building. And then the the, um, picture of the church as a body, the body of Christ, This is by far the metaphor that's used the most in the New Testament to describe the church, that the church is like the body of Jesus. We are the members that reach out and do the things that Jesus wants to do. He does it through us. And so, you know, we see this throughout the book of Romans, the book of 1 Corinthians, book of Ephesians, Colossians. All these books are... It, the central truth of these books are, hey, this is what the church is. It's like a body. It's supposed to function as the body of Christ. But we can turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. And he, Paul really, the, the whole book of Ephesians is kind of about this. But in Ephesians 1, um, verses 22 and 23, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
So here Paul is saying, he is the head. He's the, one, the part of the body that does the thinking. He doesn't need anybody else to be his head, but you are all members of his body. You are connected to him, and you are, as he says, you're the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church is the body of Jesus Christ. Now this is talking about the church universal, but it's all, it also applies to every individual church body as well. Because the body here is we are trying to do the things that he calls us to do. So as we reach out and minister to people, it's him reaching out and ministering to people. As we send people off to the mission field or down to Mexico to be able to minister to orphans down there, as we have people working technically to make it possible for our studies to be heard all around the world, and, and everything else that we do, the, the, the ministering to children, everything that we do as the church, we're doing it because we do it as a representative of Jesus Christ, and we are to function like a body in so doing that. So those are three basic metaphors that the scriptures use extensively. The church as the bride of Christ, the church as the building of God, and the church of, as the body of Christ, the physical expression of who he is. So what is the church supposed to do? It's, people have all kinds of ideas of what they think the church ought to do. And a lot of times you can get almost feature creep where you are trying to do so many things that you can actually lose sight of that which the church is actually called to do. So it's important for us to know and to keep it as basic and minimalist as possible. What's the church supposed to do? So in Acts chapter 2, right away, the, the first day of the church, the church was basically founded. It was prophesied by Jesus, but it was founded in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And after these people, 3,000 people were saved, it describes what the church did in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread, and in literally the prayers. So you have a, at least a fourfold division that says, here's what the church did right off the bat. The number one thing that's listed there, and whenever there are lists in the Bible, you need to really look at the first thing in the list because it's usually the one that's the most prominent. But it's the place for the apostles' teaching. Now, in Acts 2, I'm not sure how much teaching the apostles were actually going to do, but Peter does a pretty good job of summarizing the whole truth of the gospel. But as the church began to expand and grow, certainly there was more teaching. There was a lot more reflection from them on what was in the Old Testament that applied to Jesus. There was also an opportunity for them to tell their stories, to share the, their gospel accounts with other people, and so teaching had a prominent place. Um, there are some people who, who would say, well, you know, we have books, we have podcasts, we have, you know, uh, radio, there are all kinds of ways for us to get teaching. But teaching is a, is a gift that God gives to the body. And as a result, there's a particular call, and you can see this in Romans and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, that there is a gift of a pastor teacher, as Paul states it in Ephesians, that this is your calling to teach specifically. And I, and I really believe that that, even though there may be a lot of teaching out there, the job for people to come together, to be taught together, that's really important. That's something that was important on day one. I believe that's something that has throughout 2,000 years of church history it's still a core of what we do as a church. And it has to, you know, later on in the book of Acts when they were having an issue in Acts 6 with the, um, some of the Hellenistic Jews were complaining that their widows were not, you know, being taken care of sufficiently. 
the apostles stood up and said, look, we, it's not our job to help feed people. So you pick some people who want to do some of that kind of stuff, because it's certainly important, but we need to devote ourselves to the word and to prayer. And that's, those are the priorities for a pastor. Not even counseling, not even, all the other things that we do that are good, not even evangelism, primarily teaching the word of God and spending time with the Lord in prayer is the core of what the church actually does and one of the reasons why the church is so necessary. But the apostles' doctrine or teaching and then fellowship. See, that's something that you can't get without coming. Fellowship is how you get connected with other people, how you end up making friends, you end up making connections. It's one of the reasons why for our church we really try to get people involved in small groups. Small groups aren't just another opportunity for someone to teach you the Bible. A small group is a chance for you to get to know each other, to pray for each other, to share your life, to be able to get close to people. It's in fellowship where you begin to see yourself in a more realistic way too because if people get to know you, then they're able to tell you things that you might not even really be crazy about hearing, but it can be so helpful. We encourage each other. Friendships are so important. There are a lot of people nowadays who they just want to be taught and bug out because they've been burned by, get, by fellowship in the past. Fellowship is an important thing that the church does, and fellowship happens better in the church than it does anywhere else. It takes an effort, just like everything else, but that connection is not to be downplayed. It's something that is vitally important to us um, as the church. And then he says, you know, fellowship, and in the breaking of bread, this was most likely, because just having meals together would fit under the fellowship label, so he's probably talking about celebrating communion and the various, you know, ordinances of the church, communion and baptism, things like that. Um, it's one of the things they did. The first day on the day of Pentecost, they baptized 3,000 people. So this was important. Jesus told us to celebrate his body and blood in communion and to do it in remembrance of him until he returns and does it with us. So they, I, I think sometimes in a, in a casual low church evangelical tradition, maybe we don't make as big of a deal out of, out of celebrating the body and blood of our Lord and participating in communion as we should. We try to do it you know, every month on a Sunday and we always do it once a month on our Wednesday night together as well. And we will celebrate it as well at the Good Friday service. Um, but communion matters. It, I don't think that communion is some magical thing where the uh, you know transubstantiation is what they call it, what the Catholics believe that that the bread actually turns into his literal body, and that that the juice, when you bless it, it turns into blood. That the official dogma of the Roman church is that if you take that communion after the priest blesses it and look at it under a microscope, it's blood. It's the blood type of Jesus. To me, you know, we've rightfully gone, come on, that's, that's crazy. But at the same time, I think sometimes they have it over us in terms of at least it's a big deal to them. And we can sometimes think of it as being not a big deal. It was a big deal to the early church, I think. I remember one time I was telling the guys today that I was up at the conference center and, and they, were, they had commun the elements of communion by the back door. And they said, hey, if anybody wants to take communion, you can grab it on your way out. That's probably not quite you know, the spirit of what communion is really supposed to be. So, and then again, it's, they did the, you know, they did the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread, and then the prayers. For them, the prayers were probably a reference to praying the psalms together out loud. That was a huge part of the worship within, 
within Judaism, and then that was carried over into um, Christianity as well. Um, but prayer is a, an important part of church. We, that's why we always pray at least a few times during every church service. But also, probably what is our closest analogy to this in the way we do church is when we worship God, when we sing those songs that praise him. To me, that's an important part of the service. It's not just preliminary. It's not just like, let's get this over with. It, it should be something that we go, wow, this is something that we as the church can do together. It's very important. It's not something. Worship is not something to be listened to and then we go, eh, I think that was a little flat. Or uh, why do they have that singer? Or, oh, look how they're dressed. Or, you know, I don't like that song. Or this is too loud or too soft. It's like... I'm sorry, but that just shows that you don't have a clue about what worship is and the fact that worship is a sacrifice. And it's about those words of praise to God. It's that formal joining together in prayer that worship is about. It's not American Idol. It's not something that you can just kind of rate. It's not something that is preliminary to the service, so if you don't like it, you can just skip it and show up for the word. No, it's an important part of the church, and it's something that we, it's why tonight, even though this is a class, and even though I really, you know, feel driven to get through a lot of material because I want to cover the things that you need, but we start with a couple of songs of worship. That's what we do, and then, and then Anson prayed after that. So we'll do everything except communion tonight, and Friday, not Friday day at noon, we'll also celebrate communion. These are the central things that the church actually does. Now, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, and we see Paul giving us a, an important and helpful perspective on church and what church is supposed to, supposed to be. Um, Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 11, he's talking about Jesus who ascended into heaven. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or mature person to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we not be children anymore being flaky, but we speak the truth in love and grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So here we see that the role of the church in terms of church services is that we have gifted people who God puts in positions and certainly people acknowledge those positions. I, don't, I believe that God has called me to be a pastor. I, it, not everyone would agree with that. You know, that's cool. That's why there are a lot of churches. But I assume that people come to our church after a while that they feel like, yeah, you, you're somebody that God has called to do this. And, um, but my job primarily and the job of the officers, the leaders of the church is to help equip the saints, the Christians. Saints, by the way, doesn't, doesn't imply at all, oh, you're some really special person that's already died and did miracles. A saint is just a, a set-apart one, somebody who's a part of the ecclesia, the church. Um, but our job as a church is to equip people to do the work of the ministry. That means to teach people how to do life, to teach people how to minister to each other, to help each other to come to maturity. It's the job of the church is that's where it starts. But ministry continues through all the people 
who are a part of the church, all the people who, ha- who love Jesus are in a relationship with him, that the, the church central can give us the tools that we need, can give us the, the perspective that we need, that the Holy Spirit working through gifted people helps us to figure out how to do life. And all of that ultimately becomes, yeah, we're all parts of the body, we're all members of the body, we all have things that he's called us to do, but the church is the core of where that equipping comes. So as opposed to just giving information, like just teaching, it's the practical application that is shared with people to say, okay, here's what the Bible says, here's what it means, but here's how that can work in our lives. And so that, too, is a really important part of what the church does. So what's, why is the church even needed? Because there are a lot of people who say, look, I believe in Jesus. I've accepted him as my savior. I know my sins have been forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. Do I really need to go to church? Is it that important? Um, the church is definitely important. And there are people today who, and there was just a new poll that came out that, that there are a, over 10% of people who, who say that they are Christians, say that I love Jesus, and all their doctrine was right on, right down the line, but they said, I just don't go to church. About half of the people in our country, most of whom identify as Christians, don't go to church at all. But the thing is, in the Bible, there are no independent people. I, I, I had uh, somebody that I used to support who was a missionary, who loved going out and sharing the gospel, but he really didn't want anything to do with the church. He wasn't trying to get people to go to church. Even when he was home, he wouldn't come to church. He saw himself as a lone wolf, as a guy out there, as an evangelist, and, and yet, in reality, he had no heart for the church, no real need to connect to the church other than to get money from church. But it was, it was sad because you cannot be healthy. You can't have biblical ministry. In the Bible, there was no such thing as somebody who's just a personal evangelist, but they're not really, you know, they love Jesus, but they're not really into church. Everything that happened, even when churches were really messed up throughout history, Where God works is in his church. There isn't anything outside. There's nothing independent of church. Frankly, I think one of the great problems that's happened in church history over the last hundred years is the development of so-called parachurch organizations, where instead of a church doing educational things, doing missions things, doing evangelical things, now you have independent corporations that solicit the support of all the churches, and they aren't really out of a church, connected to a church. Some of them might be, but most of them not. But it, it's, it, it started with missions organizations. It used to be a church would send out a missionary. Then you got to where, well, there are these big organizations that, uh, let's just let them do it. We'll just send them money, and that way we don't have to mess with, you know, the, the mission field. As our church, the missionaries that we support all consider this to be their church and, and for me to be their pastor. It's just philosophically something that we've done. I just, you know, the, the idea of missionaries going around and raising support from a whole bunch of different churches is really foreign to the way that God's always done things. And I think as a result, there are a lot of people out there who work for a parachurch organization they're not even connected to a church at all. That certainly isn't healthy. Again, 10% of the people say they love Jesus, but not the church, even though they're doctrinally sound. But, you know, that's, I, I, I read somebody who said, that's kind of like saying, I really love my friend, but I hate his wife. It's like, okay, you could do that, but how long is that gonna last? How deep is your friendship going to be with your friend if you hate his wife? By saying, I love Jesus, but I hate his bride, that's like, he takes that very personally, I'm quite certain. So, as a Christian, 
as a member of the body of Christ and hopefully as a member of an individual assembly of the church as well. By the way, church isn't a salad bar where you're just, oh, I'll go there and get this and then that night I'll do this and I'll go over there and check that out and sometimes I listen to this. The, the very nature of the church is that there is an interdependence that we're not just freelance, that we are a part of a body, we're a part of a group that says we are doing life together. We are serving Jesus together. We are following him together. It, it's not, again, it's not like, hey, maybe you like going to the movies at you know, that theater where you get to sit in the recliner chairs and everything, which is cool, but then if you're like, you look on there and you go, eh, nothing's showing that I really wanna see, so maybe sometimes I go over here, maybe I'll go to, to uh, you know, the Irvine Spectrum, I'll just go wherever the movie is happening that's at the time that it works for me. That's not the way church is supposed to be. It's not a show. It's not entertainment. It's not something that is like, yep, I'll dabble here and I'll dabble there, I'll nibble here, I'll nibble there. The church is to be the center of our lives. And so, but what is the responsibility of Christians to the church? One of the first things is, and Hebrews 10.25 talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the practice of some. So one of the important elements of being a part of the church is to actually go to church, is to attend regularly. There are some people who can't do that for various reasons. I'm thankful for our technology that allows people who are shut-ins or people who live in another part of the world and don't have fellowship around them to participate with us in, in worship. I'm grateful for that, but at the same time, attending church matters. It really does. It just shouldn't be, well, you know, when I get around to it, I try to get there. You know, I'll be there at Easter and again at Christmas. That's not, you owe the church more than that. I'm not saying you owe me more than that. If somebody really doesn't like attending our church, I would want them to regularly attend someplace else. Just find a place that you go, this is important enough to me that I am going to do this. I am all in with this body. And, and so again, as Paul warned in Hebrews, there are some who just decide, nah, we don't need to go. We need to go to church. If we are not going to church regularly, we are in disobedience to the head of the church, which is Jesus. So that's first of all. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you don't need to turn there, but as I put here, you need to appreciate the gifts of others. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the fact that everybody has different gifts. And you cannot say, because you have a different gift than me, I don't need you. And he uses the example of the body about how, and, and it's interesting that the whole idea of a church member comes from a body member. It's like, you are a part of the body, your hands or feet or legs or, or lungs or eyes or ears or whatever. And Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 12, and you can read it for yourself, hey, every part of the body needs every other part of the body. And, and you should realize that every part of the body, every member is important. We need to appreciate, not just, <coughs> I, you know, as a pastor, I'm the most visible person, you know, in our church. And so I really don't come up really short of people saying, wow, thanks for what you do, or I appreciate you. And I do appreciate that. Maybe sometimes I take more garbage than everybody else, too, in some ways. But the truth is, I feel very appreciated. But man, there are a lot of people who are doing what God has called them to do using their gifts and it's so important that we appreciate them. The people that help us in the parking lot, the people who you know, are working behind the counter, the people who are working children's ministry, the people who you see cleaning up before they come here, those who set up chairs, take down chairs. There are so many things that people do, those who are praying for the church. And it's important for us to say, I appreciate what you do. I appreciate what your role is in the body. And inevitably that's awkward for people because they're not used to that. But hey, 
Paul makes it very clear. We need to show appreciation to people who are doing things in the body that are different than the things that I particularly am called to do, just to appreciate. In Romans chapter 12, um, one of the other, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 are the three passages on gifts, which we went over a lot of this when we talked about the Holy Spirit, whenever that was in the last few weeks. But um, in Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 3, he says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in the body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, generosity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. The idea here is everyone, as when we went over the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts, we saw everyone has certain spiritual gifts, and we're all different. We have different degrees of gifts, different assortments of gifts. We each have a responsibility to not only appreciate the gifts of other people, but to use the gifts that God has given us, and not only just to use them, but to use them passionately and and in a disciplined sort of way, that if this is your gift, you need to go full on for that. That's a responsibility of somebody who's a part of the body of Christ, is to find out what your gifts are, which a lot of that is by prayer, but also by just experimenting. Volunteer, try some different things, see what feels like, oh yeah, this is it. And then do it full on with everything that's within you. Work for that, you know, use your gifts well. And then in, in Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about the importance of working for unity. And I, I just wrote an article about this that will be published in another week or so at calvarychapel.com. But he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, putting up with each other in love, endeavoring, that word means pursuing, working hard at keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, because there's one body and one Spirit, and so on. So the responsibility of every person in a church is to work toward unity. Unity doesn't always come easily. If It's real easy to have unity with people who are just like you or who agree with you on everything, but what's it going to be like when there's something that you don't agree with? Now, that is the real test for unity. Somebody who kind of bugs you, somebody who just seems kind of weird to you. And, and Paul is here saying unity is so important that you all have to work at that. You all have to stretch yourself. Reach out to people that you think are a little different or that you think you can't relate to them. Maybe you think they're snooty or maybe you think they're uh, ignorant or maybe you think they're, oh, not as Christian as you or maybe you think they're so spiritual that they're not going to want anything to do with you. Our job as members of the body of Christ is to do the hard work of unity, working together together toward unity. It means reaching out to people that you don't know. It means, you know, because like, okay, I'm not a greeter, but you are. If the only time you greet anyone is when Jerry tells you to do it, okay, turn and say hi to a couple people and sit down, that's, you know, that's cool. I mean, that's nice. That's a start. But are you talking to people before church or after church? How hard are you working to really be a part of things? How much when, when you hear somebody complaining about something, do you work towards unity by, by sharing with them that, hey, this is something that, you know, this is what God's doing, and I think we all need to 
respect it and withhold, you know, hold up the, the teamwork, man, we all need to be in this together. I, I'm the pastor of the church and there are all kinds of things that happen in our church that I don't particularly agree with. But for me, it's not my job to go around and correct everything that I don't think is right. For me, it's I need to work toward unity. So if somebody's working hard at using their gifts and doing what they're doing, man, I'm going to try to go a long way to be supportive of them. And again, as the pastor, I, maybe I'll offer a little bit of input or something, but it's not easy to work with a bunch of people who are really different, many of whom have various agendas, many of whom are, you know, they just want your church to be like their old church, or, you know, they may even have particular sins that are blocking their objectivity. They may have certain hurts from their past that affect how they can see things clearly. But if everyone in the church isn't working toward unity, as Paul says, you're not going to have unity. And therefore, the one thing that Jesus prayed so passionately in John 17, his high priestly prayer, was that we would be one. And it takes every one of us working toward unity, not being divisive for that to happen. Um, The last few, and our time is about up, but um, to pray for the church. I love that in Ephesians 6, verses 18 to 20, where Paul tells them, I need you to pray for me. Here, I am ministering, I am doing this, but I desperately need your prayers, that doors would be opened up, that I would be courageous. Boy, we all have a responsibility to pray. It's one of my favorite things on Wednesday nights is we get together with a few of us early, and I don't, I'm don't not judging anybody for not coming because it's not easy for me to get here at 6.15 sometimes, but we just lift up this service, we lift up the church, various things that are going on with people. That's what we do. That's, that's what a church does, is that we bind together in praying for the church. And But you don't have to do it at a prayer meeting. By far, most prayer, and one of these Wednesdays we're going to talk about prayer, but most prayer in the Bible isn't like getting people together to pray. It's individual. As you, In fact, my prayers when I'm alone with God, I know those prayers are much better than when I'm praying aware that people are listening and me not wanting to say anything. Because like God is the least sensitive person I know, so I can say anything with him and he's not going to judge me. And, you know, so... But it's just pray, pray for the church, pray for various ministries. Philippians 4 4, he Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. It's one of the themes of the book of Philippians, which was written to Paul's favorite church. Is you as a member of the body of Christ, you as a church member, you have a command that you are to rejoice that you are to find ways to have joy. Some people, hey, they're really good at this. Like my buddy Tom down here, he's just like, he, he just has a joy that just oozes from him most of the time, or he fakes it really well. But, but at any rate, it encourages me just when I say, hey, he's, no matter what happens, Cherie down here is you know, battling with, with all kinds of medical stuff that's going on with her, yet I almost never see her where it's like, Joy just isn't there. But this isn't just a command to the people who are like, well, they're just that way. It's a command to everyone in the church. We have a responsibility to find a way to have joy, to find something to rejoice in. Again, it may be a stretch for you, but it's a command. And everyone in the church needs to do that. Do you understand what it would be like if everyone who came to church who didn't know Jesus yet would look and go, these people are really happy. I'm not talking about a fake happy, not like just, you know, uh, falling on the ground and laughing in the spirit or something. I'm just talking about like, wait, do you believe that God is in control and that he has blessed you and that there are reasons why you are optimistic? There are things that you're looking forward to. Joy. Nehemiah said it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He, they had read the law and the people were all bummed because they're like, man, we're, we're breaking all these commandments. And Nehemiah said, stop it, man. Don't mourn and weep. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If the devil can kill our joy, can stuff our joy, then he has our strength. 
So for every one of us, as members of the body of Christ, we don't just have a thing where, boy, it would be really good if we were joyful. We're commanded to find a way to express joy, to emanate joy, to emit joy. If today you don't feel joy, then there are some huge things that God is doing that you're ignoring. You're allowing circumstances to steal your joy. If the church is going to have the power that Jesus wants it to have, is partly going to be. And in Philippi, there was already persecution, there were already trials and difficulties, and yet he's going, you guys need to be happy. Not the joy, 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 joy down in your heart to stay. A joy that emanates from a person that it's like, it looks like, wow, you must know something that I don't know. Because I'm thinking about everything that's going on and I'm just bummed. Don't you know that this happened and that happened and the other thing happened? Yeah, but I know a lot of other stuff too. A lot of reasons why I know that my God is good, that he loves me, that he has great plans. And I have to bring myself. I am not a naturally joyful person. If God doesn't give me joy, it isn't going to happen. When I was two years old, one of our uh, pastors Dr. Feinberg, who's long since gone to be with the Lord, but he was also my Hebrew professor in seminary. But he saw me when I was two years old, and he said, David looks like he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. And I, I kind of look that way, even if I'm not always feeling that way. But I have to, my responsibility is to find joy every day in my life. Again, I'll probably never be like Kenny. The other day with Ken, we were, Somebody was talking about, you know anything about that cruise through the Panama Canal? And I go, no, Ken and Lindsay just did it. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'll have to ask him how it was. I go, you already know how it was. It's Ken. He's going to go, it was great, because that's his perspective. Well, that isn't just for some people. That's for everyone. That's for all of us. It's a responsibility of the church. And then there in Philippians 4, as well, verses 10 through 20, and also 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 8, Paul makes it really clear. If you are a part of the church, you are to give generously to the church. He says, if you do that, God is going to bless you. If you don't do that, you are in rebellion against God. There are a whole lot of people that really believe that somehow, I can just go to church, I don't really have to make contributions. I don't have to be generous. I'll hold it back. I'll, you know, maybe I'll give a little here and a little there. I'll, I'll you know, monitor it and try to give a, a little something. God makes it really clear throughout the scriptures. Not only as God's people are we commanded to generously give, but that is the greatest way in which you will never end up being needy ever again. I, it's amazing to me. One of these days I'm going to to, to do a study and find out how many people are really complaining and you know just constantly needing help and wanting counseling and everything. And what percentage of those people, I wonder, are actually giving? Because, and it's not just that, well, sure, if you can give easily, you don't have any problems. But you know, according to what the scriptures tell us, if you will generously give, it's amazing how God supplies all of your needs. So it's I'm not saying it because I want you to give more money to our church. I, I would tell you, give money somewhere, whatever, whatever it is that you, that you feel God leading you, but, but give because that's what you're supposed to do as a member of the church. Paul makes it clear, so if you can't give to our church and feel good about it, find a church that you can give to and, and make that your church. That would be totally fine. And then in Ephesians 5, and boy, again, I've run over already. I'm so sorry. But he talks about Christ in the church as we looked at Ephesians 5 earlier, but he makes it really clear that how you do your family, and in particular, uh, how you conduct yourself in your marriage is a picture to people of what church is supposed to be. Now, it's not always easy, and I understand things happen, but our goal should always be to look at our marriages, to look at our children and grandchildren and say, I as a member of the body of Christ 
have a responsibility to do everything that I can do to make my family look like the relationship that Jesus has with the church. That is a greater obligation that I have than to do anything else that I do. If my family doesn't look like that, it doesn't mean you can't make your, your offspring be saved. But at the same time, how you conduct yourself with them can demonstrate the kindness of God, his embracing love, the standards that he sets. They still have their own choice, but for every one of us, as members of the church, we have a responsibility within our families. And if you're not married, you really don't have, your family is the people you hang out with, your closest friends. Do those relationships look like what church ought to look like? And I think that for every one of us, that's something that it's easy to overlook. Sadly, there are a lot of people who work their tail off doing church work, and their family is just a complete mess. They didn't get that idea from the New Testament. That's not the way it ought to be because you mess up in your family and it doesn't matter how great you are, how eloquent you are, how gifted you are, you fail ultimately. If you fail at being a healthy member of a family, then you've failed at everything. But the church is to be that model, but our relationships family-wise are to be a model of what church is supposed to be. And then I... uh, Revelation 2 and 3, if you have a chance, read those over because they're the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the churches in the first century. And you learn so much if you read those verses about what the church is, what it shouldn't be, where the church can go wrong. From Ephesus that did so many things that were right and yet they had left their first love. What an indictment against one of the most prominent churches in all of church history. Um, place where Paul pastored for several years, where John pastored as well. And then you go through all those seven churches, and the last one, Laodicea, you have Jesus saying, I'm knocking on the door of the church. Why won't you let me in? You make me sick. I feel like throwing up when I look at what you've done with the body of Christ. So read those over and let God speak to you, whatever it is that, that he might want to. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thanks for not having the church be perfect because none of us would fit, none of us would be needed. Yet help us to do the best we can as members of your church, as those who participate in the life of the body of Christ. Thank you for your promise that ultimately your church The gates of hell will never prevail against it. It will go on as long as we're here until you return to bring your church to the wedding feast to celebrate. Lord, help us to be a good church as a body here. Help us each to be good members of this body. And we pray for your church all over the world. Churches everywhere, as this this week, so many churches will be celebrating your death and your resurrection. And with all of those churches, God, I pray that your spirit would just be working in a powerful way that this week, many, many people would come to recognize the truth of what the church is really all about. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, see you guys.